Welcome back to the McCann Dogs podcast. It is season four. I'm in the studio today with Instructor Swanee. Hi, everyone. And I'm Instructor Shannon. For those of you who don't know us, welcome to the McCann Dogs podcast. And today we have to talk about spring because it changes a lot of stuff with our dog it, training, now, doesn't I'm it? I'm not sure if it's ever going to come, though. I looked outside. <laughs> it's here. And it was awfully icy and I, know. I don't know. I was I pretending know. that wasn't the case, but right. we're at that period of time, actually, and this is a good time to talk about spring because we're at that point in time where everything is changing out in the environment. Right. Yes. The smells are changing mm -hmm. for our dogs. So those of you who are in our area, we're in Ontario and we have had a thaw recently, but we're headed into April and we're sure to have more storms, et cetera. And this time of year can be a challenge with our young dogs, especially if you've mm -hmm. got a young dog in training or if you've got a young dog that sort of was coming into their own and doing great. And then you started to realize that all of a sudden everything fell apart. You're probably right because it does happen. It absolutely does happen. The, the environmental change and the change in smell, mm -hmm. I think, is something that makes our dogs kind of revert a little bit because the distractions increase without us necessarily recognizing right. yes. that the distractions increase for our dogs. So They're for us too, they increase. It's yeah. like, yeah, you go outside. It's like, oh, look at that. Oh, look There's at that. There's a robin. Yeah. <gasps> There's, oh. yeah. I forgot I was supposed to be going to work and I've spent two hours looking at the robins now. Right. Or the crocus is coming up. Yes. <laughs> the crocuses. The crocuses are here. So yeah. So if you've noticed that your dog training seems to be slipping a little bit with your young dog, with your young dog in training, you are absolutely right. Spring is a tough, tough time for a lot of reasons. And depending on the age of the dog, they may weather it well and they may weather it with a little bit of challenge. So I tend to consider once my dogs are about two years old, Old, I no longer need to worry too much about those transitions from one season to the next. Mm -hmm. But up until that point, I'm always really, really aware when the seasons are changing and when I know things are going to change for my dogs. And I am tuned in to making sure that they don't fall apart because right. it can happen. Yes, definitely. It can happen. And, and a lot of the times people will think that once they get the dog trained, the training will stay in place forever. And while that's not untrue once you reach a certain age and you have skills that you can rely on. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with young dogs and that initial training, you have to consider that you're going to go through different development periods. You're going to watch that dog grow up from a baby puppy to a young puppy to an adolescent and then eventually to an adult. And all of those stages of development will bring their own challenges. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the big challenges that you consider when you're transitioning in a season like we are now? Well, um, if I have a young puppy, it may never have seen grass before. Mm -hmm. It may never have seen the dirt before and all the fun, wonderful things that are, are in the dirt and in the grass. <laughs> so there's definitely that challenge. Yep. Uh, there's just, there's an increase in animal activity outdoors mm -hmm. too. Suddenly there's robins, uh, suddenly there's more squirrels, mm -hmm. suddenly there's, uh, we have lots of bunnies in our areas. Oh, so many bunnies around here. Suddenly there's people outdoors too. Uh, you know, before we'd go to the park in the winter and we're the only ones. Now the park has tons of children, tons of people, tons of people out with their dogs. Yeah. And just, just the weather too. Uh, you know, you can feel that sun. It's, uh, there's a different smell in the air. So all these things are, are new and exciting to puppies. Yeah, absolutely. And with smells, definitely they change as the temperature changes and they'll carry differently. If there's wind, if there's rain, there's all sorts of things that will challenge a young dog when it comes to scent and to smells. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that the animals are a huge thing as well. I've definitely noticed an increase in the squirrel activity mm -hmm. in my area and <laughs> both uh, both Ned and Reggie like to go taking off after the squirrels in the backyard. So we've had to work hard on right, recall yeah. over their lives, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Ned's at a point now where I don't worry too, too much that anything's going to slip and slide because he's uh, of an age that that's not a concern. But when I have my new puppy that's coming home, hopefully within the next few months, Yay. I have a 
puppy on order and have just had some talks with the breeder that uh, things are starting to happen. So a new toll are coming into my life. And I'm going to have to be very, very aware of the season changes for the next couple of years right, with yes, that dog. Yes. Oh, one, one thing I find neat, though, is we have students all over the uh, world that we do. Uh, partake in our online do. program. 54 countries? Yes, or 64. 64, 64 countries. 64 countries. Oh my gosh, I lost 10. And we talk in Southern Ontario about squirrels. Mm. Um, we have so many squirrels. Oh in Southern, we're the hotbed of squirrels yes. here. Um, I recently lived in New Brunswick and we had barely any squirrels. Uh, you know, so it was completely different, but we had pheasants. I had pheasants all over my front lawn, but it's neat because we have talked to students who have uh, kangaroos. Yes. We talked to students who have road runners. Yeah. So it's neat hearing everyone's little niche animals yeah. that are the, uh, you know, the, the, the distraction in their area. Absolutely. <laughs> I actually said that to a student in the support group the other day. I was I was giggling a little bit and I thought, you know what, I'm going to uh, share my giggles. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's so funny that you talk about kangaroos like they're no big deal. And to me, it's like a kangaroo is almost a mythical creature right? because yes. I've, outside of a zoo, I, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a kangaroo uh -huh. <laughs> in real life, but I've also never visited Austra Australia. Right. So that makes sense. But yeah. yeah, amazing. And then we talk about squirrels and they, they don't have squirrels over right, there. Yeah. There's, there's different animals in all sorts right, of different parts yeah. of the world. Actually, it's funny. Um, I've been field training for a very long time with my tollers and in Ontario, we there's not too much that we need to worry about in terms of dangerous things inside ponds other than mm -hmm. like blue green algae and right. things like that. Ticks of course are, are a concern now, but if you talk to some of the people in the U S that are training tollers, they have to be very aware of some of the dangerous creatures that are in ponds and whatnot right. around yes. there. Um, we do have rattlesnakes and things like that, but there are fairly few and far between in this area of Ontario, although they're, they are here. Mm -hmm. So, th you know, things like that. It's, it's really interesting right. yes. to get to know what challenges are going to face dogs in different areas yes. of the world. You're yes. absolutely right. Oh, I just remembered a lady in Florida talking about, uh, she has to keep her dog away from the little lake because there's alligators in it. Yeah. yeah that, we would never even think of that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, well, and those are some of the concerns with field trainers. And right. it's like, what on earth would I do if I was concerned <laughs> there was going to be an alligator in oh, the pond that I was training? Yeah. In? Yeah. Some scary stuff right, for sure. Yeah. But, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So back to the idea of spring, the increased activities right. with squirrels oh, in our area. And Canada geese. And Canada geese. Oh yeah. my goodness. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're headed back into the yeah. area now. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because they seem to stick around all season now and right. they used to be pretty, pretty scarce right. in the winter time yes. in this area. Now mm -hmm. you can see them pretty much all year round. Right. So I think their migratory They're, patterns are changing. I think so. And I think they will eventually take over the world. Uh, yeah, for anyone that hasn't experienced Canada geese, yeah. yes, don't take them lightly. They are an apex predator. <laughs> <laughs> They also have very big poo. They do. Very big they poo. Do. So my, um, my partner is an avid sailor and there is a full-time co-op student that comes in to clean all the goose poo off of the docks. He's a and hero. This is He's a hero. A daily <laughs> job that gets done. So lots of, uh, lots of fun activities with those Canada geese, but yes. they are attractive to our dogs. Of course, mm -hmm. the squirrels are attractive to our dogs to chase. Mm -hmm. I find that, um, there's things like coyotes denning and yes. getting ready mm -hmm. to have litters. So female coyotes in season, there's all sorts of different things that would be a challenge to our young dogs. And of course, as those smells change, as those sights change, we want to make sure that we're not losing our dogs and we're yes. not losing the grounds that we have um, gained in training. So we we wanted to talk today about a few things that you can do to make sure that your training is not derailing when spring happens. Mm -hmm. So what's one of the first things that come to mind for you when you think of spring training tune-up? Probably my recall. Okay, great. Probably the recall. So, um, you know, my dog's been reliable all winter, coming when called. This is an older dog, not a baby puppy. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly in spring, it's like, the dog says, uh, I don't understand what that word come is anymore. Yeah. I just want to explore. Yeah, yes. absolutely. So what are you doing with your recall then at that point? So you've got a dog that you've already established a recall mm -hmm. with. They've had a great recall, as you said, all winter long. And now all of a sudden things are starting to slip. So what is the first action that you're going to take? First thing I'm going to do is get my long line back ah, on my beautiful. dog. Beautiful. So yes. that means putting the long line on and not allowing the dog the opportunity right. to ignore the recall. Yes. So tell me a little bit about what that looks like for you. 
Well, I'm going to head out to the park or maybe start in my yard. Um, you know, oftentimes even in the yard, the dogs in the winter are like, it's cold. Let's come back in right away. But in the spring, it's like, it's warm. Let's stay outside. <laughs> I know you got to go to work, but I'm staying outside today. So I might have to start in my yard. So I'm going to get that line out off the hook and I'm going to hook it back on the mm -hmm. dog's collar. And the first few times I'm going to follow my dog out holding that line and I'm going to do my tune up. So it's going to be come followed by that pulse on the leash and lots of re reward when my dog reaches me. And, you know, then, you know, after we do quite a few repetitions of that, I'm going to let the long line drag on the ground. But if my dog doesn't come immediately, I can immediately go and step on that line or pick it up and I can follow through with some come pop reminders. Perfect. I love that. And I and might need a super long line too. So, yeah. uh, you know, depending on my dog, if my little puppy you know, might have only needed 10 or 15 feet. But if my little greyhound puppy is suddenly now a full grown greyhound, I might need 30 feet of long lines. Yeah, so really good point. Mm -hmm. I also love that you started in the backyard first, because of course, we know that if we can't get our dogs to listen in the backyard and in the familiar areas of our homes and our property, the chances of them listening when they're out right, in a novel yes. space and the distractions are big, our, our chances all pretty much to nil. So yes. I love that you put the long line on. I love that you have started with a really bare minimum distraction mm -hmm. in an environment the dog knows well. Now, when you go out into the real world, what does that look like for you? Well, I might choose a quieter park. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to go to the park that's holding a festival and uh, <laughs> has a whole bunch of acorn trees with all the squirrels. I'm going to find and all the squirrels are invited to yes. this park. <laughs> I'm going to find a quieter park first to get started. I'm going to bring some high value treats because I want to remind my dog that coming to me has value. I'm going to bring my dog's favorite toy. So I'm, you know, bringing lots of stuff with me and we're going to uh, walk around the park. I'm going to let my dog have some of the natural distractions of sniffing trees, sniffing the shrubs. And I'm randomly going to call come in a happy, fun voice give a pop on the line and I'm going to, you know, maybe turn and run away. So my dog has the fun of chasing me when they reach me. We're going to work on the sits. We're going to give lots and lots of treats. The highlight is going to be reaching me. Yes. The, the fun of the park is reaching me on the recalls and maybe playing tug, maybe tossing a ball when they reach me. We're going to make it a lot of fun. Perfect. I love that. And the fun part is so important. And if you were to just cross your fingers and hope for the best and go to the park and knowing that things were starting to slip, you just let your dog off leash and let them go and sniff. That's not fun. It's no. not fun for the handler. It's not fun for, well, it might be fun for the dog sniffing mm -hmm. out there, but it's not fun for the situation at all. And it's not fun for your relationship. And chances are when you call your dog to come and they don't because they're in spring sniffing mode and mm -hmm. you know, whatever the case may be, you're probably going to get frustrated. You're probably going to think bad things about your dog in that moment. And that's when words like stubborn come out right. because our dogs did come all winter long mm -hmm. and they were great. And now all of a sudden they're not anymore. And we start thinking ill of our dogs. So I love that you've built all this value back up and put right. so much importance yes. on building the value. Well, I always look at my training as if, if my dog's not coming to me, it's, it's not my dog's fault. Yeah. I look at myself. Ding, 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 I ding, look ding. at myself. It's like, what have I skipped? What have I missed? I've let my dog down yeah. because now my dog is potentially in danger. And if my dog takes off and, you know, gets on the road, that was my fault. Yeah. That was my fault. I wasn't looking after them. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in our relationship with our dogs, we are the owners, handlers, you know, uh, caretakers of them, and they are the learners. Mm -hmm. And if you find yourself blaming the learner for the lack in the situation, that's going down a dangerous mm -hmm. road. We, we, this is something that's really important to us because of course we're teaching people to teach their dogs. And if the people are not necessarily getting what we're trying to teach, we know that we're not teaching well. Mm -hmm. We know that we need to adjust our approach and everybody has different learning styles and, and part of our experience leads us to acknowledging those different learning styles and being able to communicate with those different learning styles. So same thing is so true with our dogs. We right. need to make sure that they can understand our learning style. Yes. And, and, and there's actually a just, uh, there's a famous quote by mm -hmm. uh, an animal trainer named Bob Bailey. Okay. And uh, this quote is so true. It's uh, true. Training often fails 
because the human expects too much of the dog and too little of themselves. Perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Doesn't that just say it all? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So if your dog is struggling, you need to look critically at what you're doing mm -hmm. and not that you need to put blame anywhere. It's nobody's fault. It's just life. Life right. is ever evolving mm -hmm. and sometimes things happen. And I think that um, once you've been in dogs long enough, you have been humbled by dogs to a point where you're like, nah, you know what? It doesn't bother me anymore. I know that I've made that mistake and I just need to pick up my bootstraps or what is that the right expression? Pull, pull up your bootstraps. Pull up my bootstraps. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to pull up my you bootstraps. Up, you can pick them up too. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Or maybe I need to think a little bit outside the box. You know, maybe what I'm doing is not working for the learner for that, that dog, I yes. am teaching. So it would be silly of me to keep banging my head against the wall, doing the same thing right, and expecting yes. different results. I mean, that really is not a productive right, way yes, of thinking. Yes. So I need to change something mm -hmm. to help my dog get it right. And one of the first things that we need to go to as caretakers for our dogs is the value. Where is the value for this dog? And if I've gone to the park and my dog is sniffing and, you know, maybe eating bunny poo or something of that nature, because yeah. that's a delicacy in this area <laughs> of Ontario Oh, it is, well. yes. Yeah, yes. Actually, I was working with a young dog yesterday and I got completely snowed because I wasn't expecting the bunny poo oh, to be a big challenge. Right. I was out and about. We were filming a video and I was working with this dog and all of a sudden I was like, okay, there is literally hundreds of little tiny pieces of bunny poo and this young oh. dog was really intrigued by the bunny poo. So I had to roll up my sleeves and train through it. But the plan that I had going in was not the plan that I ended up executing. So mm -hmm. I had to stop for a second, and take a step back, think about what I needed to change, and then put that into practice to help this young dog. As a child, I was told that that's how the Easter bunny makes the Easter eggs. <laughs> And as an adult, I realized, no, no, rabbits do not poo Easter eggs. They lied to you. Yes. They, so I, yeah. They fibbed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, I won't tell you anything about Santa Claus. We won't talk about that. No, no, I, I no, no, I'm not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, it's so important to evaluate where the value is. And of course, our dogs being dogs. They like to eat bunny poo. They like to sniff other dogs' pee and poo and leavings. And they like to eat stuff that we would find horrible yes. and gross. Yes, like that squash squirrel from two years ago that right? uh, yeah, just yeah. got exposed. Yum. Yeah. <laughs> yummy, yummy. Or roll. Or roll in it. <laughs> or yes. roll in it. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to acknowledge that as scavengers, that is going to be something that appeals to their nature. And as hunters, things like critters running fast is going to appeal to their nature. They might not appeal to our nature. We might not ever want to rule on a dead squirrel from two years ago. <laughs> Honestly, I've never even thought about that being a possibility for right, us. right. <laughs> but now, now it's in my head. Next right? time I see a dead squirrel, I'm going to think about it, but I'm probably still going to refrain. But my dog wouldn't refrain. So there's value in mm -hmm. that for them. And a lot of the times as humans, we expect them to find the things that we find valuable, valuable, but we're not respecting the species of the dog when we do that. So we need to acknowledge that they're going to find things like sniffing and peeing and all of that very valuable. And we need to provide them with more value value for listening to us in situations where they would much rather roll in that right. squirrel yes. or roll in that dead mm -hmm. thing. You know, dogs are really cooperative by nature. They want to do the right thing, but they're also dogs and they also have their own agendas a lot of times. So what we do with training is we manipulate that situation a little mm -hmm. bit and we help the dog align what they find valuable with what we find val valuable by appealing to the nature of the dog. Right, yes. And things like you said, chasing. You mm -hmm. said you might run away. Dogs love to chase. They are predators. Yeah. That when that prey drive kicks in, mm -hmm. that is an endorphin rush central for the dog and it's making them feel good and it's making them, you know, fulfilling their purpose. Mm -hmm. So chasing us is a great way of building reward. Of course, you said you might tug. Mm -hmm. That's another way to help right. with that predatory and chasing drive. Chasing with a tug at the end is even better. Yes. I'll often have a, a long furry tug and I'll call the dog's name, turn and run and wave that fuzzy toy and then start going. Yeah. And my dog is chasing me and snatching the tug at the end. So yeah. it's double the fun. 
Absolutely. And of course, with our recall, we first teach the dog how to churn on that word come. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we start to challenge the dog with distractions and whatnot. So you might have them in a sniffing moment, Mm -hmm. call come. And then once they commit to us, once they actually turn off that sniff and say, oh, you're talking to me, that's when we have all of these wonderful things to say, chase me, come and get this toy. I'm going to give you a jackpot of food when you get to me. Like we really, really want our dogs to think value is going to happen when they get to us. And it needs to be valuable enough for them to leave whatever it is they're finding valuable on their own and defer to us and our value. Yes. Yes. And we want to be aware of the environment too. Yes. So when I go somewhere, I'm always scouting out what might interest my dog. I'm Mm -hmm. looking around and when I see my dog glance that way or start to move that way, I'm going to stop the dog then. I'm not going to wait until the dog gets to wherever they're headed. I'm going to stop it en route because it's much easier to interrupt the behavior early in the dog's thought process. Yeah, absolutely. So you're thinking about, are you thinking about sniffs or squirrels or what's the distraction? Even even a water distraction, maybe like, uh, you know, say um, we're, we're on the trails and suddenly there's a little Creek and you know, maybe it's, it's very muddy. I don't want the dog super muddy in my car, or I just don't want them getting into that water because I don't want a wet, cold dog. (laughs) So as I see my dog go, Oh, water. You know, I'm going to be saying, oh, dog, I need you back here right now. Like I got something better for you. Yeah, that's a really good point. So once they've sort of committed to a distraction, you're going to have a much more challenging time calling them off of it, which isn't to say that you can't call them off of Mm -hmm. it, but just know in your training process that earlier is always going to be the easier thing. I found uh, with, especially with my Saluki, uh, a dog very intent on chasing and a dog very, very primitive in their behaviors, Mm -hmm. I found I needed to get my thought in her head first. Gotcha. So even when we got out of the car, and she she was a a well-trained dog, so I wouldn't put her on leash getting out of the car running to the house. Mm -hmm. We were on a quiet street. Uh, You know, there was seldom anything there that would distract her. But I still knew I wanted my thought in her head. So as she's getting out of the car, I'm saying, in the house, in the house, in the house. So I knew Cowboy's brain was going, house, 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 house. And even if a squirrel did appear... I knew Cowboy was going house, house, house. She's and that, on task. Yeah, she was on task. Exactly. That's yeah. the way to put it. Um, but if I just let her hop out of the car, she would hop out of the car with an empty brain, see the <laughs> squirrel and be squirrel, 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 squirrel. And it would be much harder for me to get my voice into her little brain. Yeah, no doubt. That's an interesting thing to think about. Mm-hmm. Squirrel, 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 squirrel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So recall is definitely one of the things that we are always working to make sure that it continues to improve. Um, So we've talked about a young dog. Let's talk about an established dog. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you do with your dogs that are well-trained, like say Ned at six years of age? Is there anything that you would do with a dog that's that age when the seasons start to change just to establish value, just to remind them of things? Well, I I would review all my training exercises. Uh, You know, there's, by practicing, you keep your dog sharp. Yes. So I, and I love training my dog. Mm-hmm. My dogs love being trained. So I'm, you know, I'm always giving them little refreshers yeah, and nice. I'm, I'm always aware of, uh, you know, the different seasons and what those things might present. And, uh, I, you know, I review my walking on leash. I mm-hmm. review my weights. I review my stays. I re- review my fetch you know, exercises. Um, you know, even the first few times I might play fetch with my dogs off leash in the spring, I'm going to have a long line dragging from my dog. Okay. Just in case you, yeah. you never know. You never know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will tend to plan out reinforcement. Right. So with Ned, for example, I know I said that, you know, at six years old, he's pretty well established and I don't worry too much about it, but I also try to stay in front of it to make sure that, you know, our, our skills don't start to mm-hmm. slip. We tend to do a lot of off leash hikes. I really like getting lost out there in the world with my dog. It's one of my most peaceful times that I can have and mm-hmm. really rejuvenating for me. So then I can, I can face another week of busyness. Right. And um, I will often think about, okay, do I need to 
get in some some very definitive random reinforcement at this point. Mm -hmm. And of course, random reinforcement, we know dogs love to gamble just like humans love to gamble. That excitement of, you know, pulling the slot machine Mm -hmm. arm versus going to the bank machine. We talk about that quite a bit on the podcast. And I think that it's important to make sure that we are following through with random reinforcement throughout our dog's lives to keep those skills fresh. Mm -hmm. So I have all sorts of other reward systems that I use with Ned. Water is a big reward for him. Mm -hmm. If there's any sort of water around at all, whether it's a puddle or a stream or a pond, I can use that as a reward by telling him, okay, go swim. And he takes off and runs to that water. And you can just tell like that, that permission to go swim. I've gatewayed the, the reward basically, you know, you need to do what I want first before you can do what you want. And he absolutely get such value out Mm -hmm. of that release to water. Um, I will pick up things that are random, you know, pine cones on this property, for example, they're everywhere. If it is still snowy, I will pick up snow and create a little snowball and throw that for him. And he just thinks that's about the best thing in the world. Mm -hmm. If there's nothing around, I'll often use butt scratches. So those are sort of rewards that I use all the time in my day-to-day hikes, my day-to-day life. But I will also make sure that Every once in a while, I throw a big hunk of cheese in my pocket or I throw Mm -hmm. a tennis ball in my pocket so that at some point on our hike, I can say, Ned, or come, or whatever the case may be. And when he responds, I can have this surprise reward yes. for him. So it's it's fairly rare that I bring a hunk of cheese with me. But when I bring that hunk mm-hmm. of cheese out and give him a little jackpot from that hunk of cheese, he is always like, wow, that was great. And building that random reinforcement Mm -hmm. really strengthens the behaviors. And anybody who's been, um, been in dogs and been training for a while knows that there's a point that you get to where you've done all the training and you've done all the teaching and you've done all the proofing and you need to start to wean away from the rewards. And there's this like sick feeling in our, in your gut that you start thinking, Oh, I don't want it to fall apart. I don't want it to fall apart. And I'm always amazed with each new dog I work through this with how much the behavior strengthens as long as you do all this in the right order. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're not jumping the gun with random reinforcement, as long as you're not forgetting to reinforce randomly, as long as there is in enough value there on a random basis, the behaviors actually get stronger, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. I always, I always love that feeling of empowerment when I get to that point. And I know I feel the like anxiety in my gut first, mm-hmm. and then the reminders of things getting better just really empowers and reinforces that we're on the right track and things are great. So what do you think about, um, about random reinforcement? Red- Does it trip your trigger? Oh, def- definitely, definitely. <laughs> yes. I'll, um, I'll use a uh, tug of war with my leash okay. often. That's, uh, you know, my dogs Love think that. that, you know, cause you know, they can't play with their leash when we're walking. Yeah. However, sometimes you can play tug of war yeah. if I give them permission mm-hmm. and they think that is the greatest. It's like, oh, here's this taboo thing. And now we can bite the leash Yes. and we'll have a good game of tug of war with the leash. And, um, you know, they give it up. No problem. Um, because they understand they can only take a hold of it when I give them permission. It doesn't create problems. Um, One of my dogs loved to pull on my pant legs or pull on my shoelace. And that was a great reward for her. I would give her permission. I'd wiggle my leg around. I'd say, tug, tug, tug. And she would grab my pant leg and play (laughs) tug. Um, I even had one dog that would love to steal my mittens. Ah. And, um, uh, you know, of course, they can't steal your mittens. So we had to work on that. But sometimes as a reward... (laughs) you could steal my mitten. I would suddenly like, oh, get it, get it, get it. And the dog would be like, I can take your mitten off. This is the greatest day of my life. And they'd pull my mitten off and they would run and toss it in the air and pick it up. And I'd have a wet mitten to wear home. But But the dog had, yeah, the dog had so much fun with this mitten. So yeah, often things that are naturally with you all the time can be turned into random motivators. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the nice thing about having a dog that you have trained. You can give them permission to grab the leash. You can give them permission to quote unquote, steal your glove Mm -hmm. and have a little party with that within the rules of those games. And a lot of the times people will, will be a little bit misguided when it comes to tug, especially tug Mm -hmm. of war is always one of these things that we are constantly teaching and trying to uh, help people understand how to use this as a great training tool and a great great engagement tool with our dogs. So a lot of the times people think that, and there's this, you know, we did, um, we did a podcast, a 
couple of months ago now about all of the the fallacies that right, exist myths, in yes. dog training. And of course, tug of war was top of the list. A lot of the times people are under the misguided notion that teaching your dog tug of war will make them aggressive. And actually teaching your dog to play tug with you will do the exact opposite thing because what we're doing when we use tug as a tool is we're teaching them. They can't take the toy until we give them permission. They can't use their teeth on our skin and they have to give the toy up on command. We're also teaching them that when we have that toy in our hand, that doesn't mean that it's game on. Mm -hmm. I will spend a lot of time with those toys teaching emotional control, wiggling the toy around, throwing it, rewarding my dog for not going for it until I've said, yes, get it, and given them actual permission to play. So mm -hmm. doing these things teaches them when it's appropriate to tug, only when you've given them permission to, how to tug and play appropriately, and how to give the toy up on command, right. which then allows you to take this game and put it in the context you were talking about, right. where now you can say, okay, you know what? I'm going to let you play tug with your leash. Get it. Mm -hmm. And you have a fun little game. And then, of course, you can use your out when you're ready and the dog drops the drops the leash or your sock or your pant leg mm -hmm. or, you know, <laughs> what's next? <laughs> well, I prob probably not my sock because I'm not going to be walking in my socks down the street. <laughs> you should teach your dog to just steal your just steal. steal your shoe. Ac yeah, actually, um, our, our Sheltie, when you watch TV, she would come over and look at your foot. And I knew she wanted to <laughs> to play tug with your foot. And, um, and sometimes we would let her. And because she was the gentlest dog, I, I wouldn't have let my Malinois play tug on my foot. That's oh my for goodness. sure. Yeah. I would have lost all my feet. <laughs> but uh, my, our Sheltie was very delicate. And uh, you'd wiggle your toe and that would be her, okay, I can get a foot. And then she'd like kind of bite at your foot and growl and have fun. And, uh, you know, just it. it, it you have to, like what works for one dog doesn't always work for the yeah, other dog. Absolutely. So that's something you have to keep in mind too. Like, you know, you might've had a, a Labrador, you know, as your last dog and everything worked out great, but now you've got another Labrador or maybe you've gotten a Husky and things are going to be different because yeah. every dog's different. So training has to be adjusted and what you allowed your last dog to do, you might not allow this next dog to do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the nice thing about training is that you can individualize and you can make things work to your advantage. So, mm -hmm. um, so in terms of fine tuning training for the spring, is there anything else that jumps to mind for you? Um, just, you know, things like uh, just doorways too. You don't dash out a doorway. You don't okay. dash out an, an, an open gate. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah, just the things, the more outdoor things that yeah. you're going to do. Like just, yeah, like um, I might review uh, when my, my son was small, um, we would often go to his soccer games or his baseball games. So I'm going to review practicing carrying the lawn chair mm -hmm. and the dog and all the snacks I've had to bring for the entire soccer game. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and having my son like, oh, I don't want to pull my socks up and put my shin guards in. Like, and at the same time, I'm trying to, you know, do all these things. So yeah. I'm going to review walking on leash nicely, mm -hmm. my leash respect. I'm going to review, you know, lie down, you know, on this mat maybe that I'm going to bring to the game and that's your spot. Um, I'm going to review greeting manners because mm -hmm. uh, more people are out and about. So yes. I'm, I'm going to think of things that are now happening with spring arrival yeah. and I'm going to work on those things. Um, yeah, I, you just can't expect your dog to to know these things. Yeah, they, absolutely. Yeah. And if it's something that is fairly seasonal and they haven't done it in a while, it's going to be good for them to get a refresher. I mean, right. if you if you've not done calculus since high school, which I haven't. I don't think I've done calculus since high school. I wouldn't have a clue where to start. I would right. definitely need a refresher. Mm -hmm. I probably would have need a, needed a refresher 15 years ago, <laughs> maybe 20 Right. Yes. <laughs> at any rate. The other thing that I think a lot about during spring is the appearance of mud. Oh, <laughs> everywhere. Mud, 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 yes. mud everywhere. So things like muddy paws, things like needing more bathing, maybe needing more trips to the groomer or more trips to your grooming table if you do your own mm -hmm. grooming, et cetera. So uh, handling yeah. is such an important thing. And I don't think there's ever a time of year that handling is not important right. because and you never checking know. Checking for ticks too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You never know what kind of situations you're going to run into with your dogs where you're going to need to be able to immobilize them and help to fix a cut or help to do some sort of first aid. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that our dogs are accustomed to being handled so that we can keep them safe right. in the, you know, during the not so great times, yeah. but during the great times, mm -hmm. we can just easily 
wash their paws right. or plunk them in the bathtub and give them a quick hose off, et cetera. As you said, checking for ticks. Yes. Unfortunately, we've had such an increase in the tick population mm-hmm. in this area that now this is a part of our regular life. Yeah. Um, there's one of our YouTube videos from, I want to say eight or nine years ago, maybe it's been a while now and, oh no, it can't have been cause it was Ned and he's only six. So it must've been five or six years ago. He was probably a young dog at the time, I guess. Um, but, uh, I took a tick off of him and I took it off live on camera because I thought, okay, well, you know what? Right. Great learning yeah. opportunity. And, uh, we've, that, that video has had many, many, many mm-hmm. views somewhere in the millions. And I hear the warble in my voice and I see how, hard of a time I had pulling this tick off because I really wasn't very experienced with it at that point. Uh-huh. And unfortunately now it's a piece of cake You're for me. It's very sad to yes. say that I have had more than my fair share of ticks being pulled off my dog, despite being on mm-hmm. preventatives, which is one of my next things that right. I wanted yep. to talk yep. about. Getting them yeah. yep, tick and flea and heartworm. Yes. Exactly. So handling so that you can go to the vet and they can do their annual checkup. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even if they're not due for vaccines, it's so good for your vet to be able to easily put their hands on your dog, mm-hmm. you know, listen to their heart, feel all over. If you have a dog that is either worried about that or doesn't know how to sit still, that can be a real challenge Mm -hmm. and things can get missed in terms of their health lumps and bumps and things like that if they can't be still enough to be examined. So uh, those are such important things. And Mm -hmm. like I said, I think handling is an important thing all of the time, but definitely in the spring, it's a good time to do that little mental tune up and have a little checklist and do a little tune up with your dogs Mm -hmm. and just reestablish value for the hand handling things so that they know what your expectation is and how to perform that and how to be still and confident as well. Mm -hmm. So some, some really, really important things to definitely um, make sure that you are not leaving off your list, even just removing debris from your dog's coats. You know, it's so important that they're, that they're comfortable with you reaching out to touch them and, you know, even, even on the trail saying, Mm -hmm. Oh, just wait for a second. I'm constantly pulling burrs out of Ned. Yes. Constantly. Mm -hmm. He's got this very lovely rough. He's got lovely feathery tail. And of course those are burr magnets for him. So I'm constantly pulling him up on the trail and, you know, I do my chin exercise where he rests his head in my hand Mm -hmm. and I start pulling burrs out of his coat and then I tell him, okay, (laughs) <laughs> and off he goes again to get more burrs and right. we do it all again. Yeah. I remember one time Honda, was, Honda is my Chinese crested powder puff okay. and he was in full coat mm-hmm. and a powder puff in full coat is a lot of coat. And he, we were running him and um, all of a sudden he just sort of stopped and he was a distance away, but I could see him. It was a golf course. So it was very open just before the golf course opened. And um, he was just standing there and then he kind of just flopped over on his side and I called him and I could see him looking at me, but there was no response. And I'm like, oh, he's hurt. Like, oh my gosh, what? Something's bad's happened. So I go running down there and he had so many burrs in his coat. He had glued his hind leg to his chest oh with my burrs. Goodness. So his, his, his leg was actually glued with, with burrs and... I couldn't get them. I couldn't get, I I was terrified. I couldn't get those, this, my dog undone. So luckily he's small. So I could carry him to the car. And, um, I, I I think even in the cars, like I I can't get these off and ended up having to go home. And, um, I think we ended up, he ended up becoming a short haired dog that day. Oh my goodness. (laughs) But, um, you know, his coat grows back of course, but, um, uh, yeah. Well, uh, tip for if you're going into oh. burr areas, there's a product called Shoshin that works very well oh. if you spray it on the dog beforehand. And I have heard, I've never used this myself, but I have heard that, that Pam will also help Pam? to, yep, yeah, if you put some, <laughs> spray some Pam in your hands, yeah. I would guess. I wouldn't spray it directly on right? the dog. Because it's a cooking oil. It's yeah. a cooking oil. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's safe for them to eat. But, right. you know, spray a little bit on your hands, rub it on the coat. Yeah. And of course, because that is slippery, often the burrs will come out a little bit easier. Yes. The other tip that I have for burrs, because I've removed a lot you of said, them. Well, that might help for ticks as well. I wonder if the coat's got a bit of slickness to it. But if the ticks can't grab oh, on as easy. They're so evil. I don't know that anything can stop those tick, things. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my dogs on um, topical preventatives and still pulled off a ton of ticks. Like right. it's, I, um, I'm anxious about using any of the ingestibles, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. 
there doesn't seem to be a lot of effectiveness in the topicals anymore. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do this year, but that's a whole other topic. You should topic. get some pet opossums because I heard opossums <laughs> eat tips. I could just put an opossum on Ned's back and then we'll, <laughs> well, yeah, we'll go on from there. Or a cat so, and a goose. <laughs> the other tip that I have about burrs though is remove the hair from the burr. Do not re- try to remove the burr that's, from yes, the hair. Yes. Remove the hair I've from heard the burr. That, You'll have yes. a much easier time. And that one I can definitely attest to. Yes. Now I just put Honda in a big bubble now. And yes. That's walk a good him idea. in a big bubble. Keep yeah. those burrs away from him. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been a fun episode. Anything else you want to talk about in terms of spring? Get out and enjoy it. Yeah, get, that get, too. Get out and enjoy yeah. it with your dog. Um, it's, you know, we, we see the season change and, you know, we're, you know, older. We've seen a lot of them, but to- I've ex- only seen a few. Well, if you, that's that. true, yes. <laughs> like to, to experience it through your dog's eyes, like yes. to, you know, to watch your dog just- love to, you know, smell some, you know, fresh patch of grass yeah. or, uh, you know, to snuffle along a river bank, uh, you know, just, and to feel, or, or my old dog, he goes outside and it's not warm here by any means yet, but the sun has a new warmth mm-hmm. and my old dog goes out and you can just see him basking in that warmth and, right, and just, you know, putting his head up and, uh, yeah, so enjoy, you know, take take your dog's lead and, and enjoy that change of oh, weather. I love it. That is great advice to end on. On that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. I'm Instructor Swanee. Happy training. <laughs> Happy training. <laughs>